thank you guys so much for joining this call and uh, being here with us. Uh, I'm Dylan Kowalik. I'm your host from BNB, and we all met during ETH Denver, and it was really exciting to see how we were going to basically bring on the next million users and the next massive wave of adoption uh, into Web3. And I, I had to get you guys onto a podcast because you guys came up with some really awesome use cases and, and reasons how that was actually going to work. So let me just go in order and, and ask you about what your guys' role is, what do you do, and, and uh, what do you work on at the company that you're at right now. So uh, yeah, so Kevin, if you uh, want to take it away first, uh, what's going on with storage? Sure thing. Yeah. So my role at storage is to work with partners, customers, users of the decentralized storage network and help enable them to take advantage of the benefits around parallelization, better security through encryption, better performance uh, and better economics. Uh, I've been in the crypto industry for a while. I originally started the blockchain club at Wake Forest University back in 2016 and was Storage's first developer evangelist uh, focused mainly on the university segment. After graduating, I worked at Microsoft where I was on the Azure blockchain workbench team, uh, helped drive uh, some outcomes for one of Microsoft's first blockchain related products, uh, worked with, came, then went back to Storage, uh, and then led a lot of the storage partner program in the open source space. I led what was called the Storage Open Source Partner Program bringing on partners like MongoDB, InfluxDB, FileZilla, and others, helping them, again, architect solutions uh, using decentralized cloud storage within their own workflow to some capacity. Uh, since then, I, I left, I started a, an NFT company last year, Web3-based company, uh, leading uh, Web3 loyalty with companies like Eleven Miami uh, and the Inbetweeners, uh, which is uh, Justin Bieber and Giancarlo's Web3 project. Uh, sold that company, came back to storage. Uh, so now I'm leading uh, the generative AI and Web3 space at storage. And so I'm really focused on generative AI workloads and how that's going to be transformative broadly across the tech industry uh, and how the decentralized cloud plays into that, which we'll get into. Wow. Justin Bieber. I wonder what J Justin Bieber has to say about decentralized cloud storage and uh, NFTs. Is he making an NFT? Does he Does he care about that kind of thing? It's a good question. So his profile picture for a while was one of the in-betweener bears, um, which uh, was a project that I worked with about a year ago, building out a, a physical redeemable workflow, uh, which was an app that used storage on the back end, uh, Pocket, decentralized RPC on the back end, in an EVM based architecture where people would have a token represented a hoodie that was by the same people that made Drew House, the big smiley face, a uh, pretty famous brand. You could trade that token when you burned it, you could redeem it, get shipped the physical item. And, and Justin Bieber was kind of a, a part of the Inbetweeners project. Uh, oh, wow. And, That's and I think wild. I didn't know that Justin was into that. I, I know that a lot of celebrities like Snoop Dogg and other people are trying to get themselves into it. I think that's a whole part of the whole mass adoption thing. And you got, you're literally at the forefront of working with some of those celebrities. So that's really interesting. Yeah, we can definitely get into that a little bit later because I'm curious on how you guys somehow got in touch with Justin. Maybe we can uh, work together on figuring that out with other key influencers. So <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you, Kevin. And on uh, our right, we have Flavian, the CEO of uh, Beware Labs. What is it that you guys work on and um, what do you work on at Beware? Uh, so at Beware Labs, we are focusing on multiple areas of, uh, you know, multiple directions, let's, let's say. Uh, but they are mostly around how we can help ecosystem, ecosystem thrives, thrive, how we can uh, empower developers and how we can make life easier, uh, easier to, uh, to it, in general, to an ecosystem to, uh, to develop by itself, right? So uh, we have one way of doing that through our validator uh, uh, line. So we help uh, blockchain projects to secure their, their network through, um, through our validator experience and our uh, you know, DevOps implications. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we are also uh, involved at 
data level, let's say. So uh, we have uh, a product BLAST API uh, with which uh, we serve APIs to developers on multiple blockchains uh, in a decentralized manner. So that's, uh, that's mainly what, what we are doing at Beer Labs. My, my role uh, there is, uh, is that I lead the business development team. Uh, so we focus on, uh, uh, on exploring what type of uh, relationship we can build, uh, mostly long-term uh, relationships with uh, projects that matter and uh, uh, where we can help more uh, with, with our technical uh, background and technical stack, let's see. Wonderful. And also another... Another role is around the vision and what other products we can build and how everything goes uh, in that direction. Wonderful. That's um, that's really clear. So here in my notes, I see that both of you have been obviously in the blockchain space forever. And clearly you work on uh, the infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure of blockchain and Web3 often gets super overlooked. And I don't think many people really understand that it really starts right here. This is ground zero operations. And if this doesn't work, nothing works. And if this isn't big, fast and incredible, nothing that we expect in terms of our Web3 experience is big, fast and incredible. So it all starts right here. And I just want to really kind of point on that point right there and just if anyone doesn't know what mongodb is and what filezilla is or who justin bieber is well you're missing out because these are the biggest things um and the 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 big question that i really had for for both of you guys since you're both coming at the infrastructure uh dilemma in a decentralized approach is really is what are the benefits of trying to decentralize infrastructure? Why is it that we're trying to move away from a centralized infrastructural, oh, that's a tongue twister, infrastructural approach into a decentralized approach? Um, Kevin, if you want to answer that really quick, because I know that you you guys work on this at storage a lot. Yeah, sure thing. There's a bunch of different benefits to decentralization. The way that I tend to think of it is as a Triforce. Uh, I like to use the Zelda analogy. There are three main benefits to decentralization. The first is around security. So by leveraging decentralized systems, you can basically spread risk across, in this case, different storage providers. So just like to, you, know, you wouldn't put all of your money in one bank, to use an apt analogy, you might not want to put all of your data with one data provider. So with decentralized storage, you're able to have better security by first encrypting data, and breaking it up into small redundant pieces called erasure codes, and then spreading that data across a network of nodes that are that have different owners, that have different software that's running on them, different operating systems, different types of hardware. Uh, and, and through that kind of network architecture, the decentralized network architecture, you're able to get much better resilience uh, and much better security than you would with the centralized provider. Uh, the second main benefit is obviously speed. Uh, so by leveraging the, the properties of parallelization, which means breaking up the packet streams into multiple threads, and I can go into actually what this looks like from a network, visual, uh, network visualization standpoint in a minute, you're able to get better performance. Just like uh, you would parallel, parallelize, which is a tough word to say, AI operations to basically increase the rate at which you can train a model with the GPU, you also want to parallelize the way that data streams across the internet to get better performance speeds. Uh, at storage, the way that it works is that every file is broken up into 64 megabyte segments. Each seg 64, segment, uh, 64 megabyte segment has 80 pieces, and you need any 20 of the 80 pieces to rebuild the file. When you call the file, you stream all 80 in parallel. And the first 20 to get to the client reconstitute or rebuild that file at source. And so what that means, you have this big global pool of nodes but only the ones that are the most latency minimized, the ones that are the closest are the ones that are gonna deliver you that file. Uh, and so that architecture is what drives the performance advantage, which is the second main advantage of decentralized storage. The third is economics. And so from an economic perspective, uh, at storage, we've been able to build a network that's one-tenth the price of Amazon S3. Amazon S3 is kind of the standard for cloud object storage, for applications, for data and AI workflows, 
for really any kind of business workflow that we see that in uh, you know that runs today. And so by able so being so by being able to offer that at one tenth the price of Amazon, that's an enormous economic advantage. Uh, and then if you wrap those three advantages together, we're able to build a better developer experience where developers, because of the way the network's architected, because of the resilience, the performance, the economics, they don't have to worry about where to put data. They just point towards a single endpoint and that data is globally available. And so that, that's what constitutes that Triforce, kind of the three main benefits that create that better developer experience. It's secure because of the amount of redundancy that's happening across many different storage providers. And then it's doing so through erasure encoding. And then we're getting a better user experience through parallelization. And that's the cost efficiency uh, is also reduced by a lot because of the amount of spread that's happening amongst the entire network of nodes who could be enhancing the hardware, the CPU drives, the operating systems. It could be a multitude of things. And we're collecting this universal experience using some crazy segmentation that you're doing with this 20, 80, 80, 20 rule. And then me as a user, I get to experience all of this through AI, through business development, and it's all sourced through one single set of API or APIs in general. So that is insane. And I know that, well, from the BNB's point of view is that we're curious about how exactly it is that you save so much on the cost uh, because I know that storage and Greenfield are going to be um, two peas in a pod and it's going to work really seamlessly together. And of course, I want to understand a little bit better on how that's actually going to go out there. But, you know, um, thank you for that explanation. But now uh, um, I want to I want to bring it back over to uh, Beware Labs, because I know that you guys had mentioned something about Blast API. So Flavian. Can you explain to me about this, um, the developer experience and why it is that we are uh, benefiting our today's infrastructure with de decentralized infrastructure and how is it that you're solving for this with the Blast API? Can you explain what this uh, is doing? For sure. So for this question, uh, I will also would like to refer to a, belie a belief that we have at uh, Beer Labs uh, with our Blast product that you are only as decentralized as your most centralized component. I fail to see what's the point in running a DAP if you're doing it through a centralized infrastructure provider. Because by, uh, you know, by uh, the simply naming of it, a DAP is a decentralized application, right? And running through an infrastructure, a uh, centralized infrastructure, that kind of breaks the the uh, philosophy of the whole thing and at the same time uh, decentralized infrastructures uh, allows for more customer trust better reliability a lot a lot higher margins which in turn translate to better prices prices for builders so actually uh, developers uh, w would uh, benefit from that simply because they would have lower costs on their on their projects and in this market and in the last year, uh, we've been in a stressful position and the whole uh, community or developer community needed, needed that. Uh, in our case, another important factor to take into account is, uh, is also the fast response time. Because when a request is being made, it goes to the nearest node and being decentralized, that increases the chances of sending a request very close to our geographical location. And last but not least, it gives the community a way to get involved. And in, in my opinion, the sense of community is one of the greatest things about, uh, about Web3. I love the um the take that you just had on this with the philosophy behind what decentralization actually means to you a few episodes to go i had a uh, koi network um al from koi network uh hop onto the podcast and he was explaining to me the the motto decentralization or die and what's the point of doing this if we're not taking in that effort of further decentralizing what it is that we're actually doing uh, cause why else do it? So, but can you explain to me a little bit more about 
what this is uh, doing, this API that you have available? Is it making the, uh, like say like the storage API or the Greenfield API, is the Blast API just making this single endpoint more accessible on more machines? Is that what it's doing? Yes, of course. Uh, so if you think of it, uh, the apps uh, would need access to blockchain data. And how they do that is by I either they run their own nodes, which uh, leads to higher maintenance. You have to have a DevOps team or things like that. Or you can either use an API, uh, API for getting that, that data. And you go to a API provider and that API provider can be centralized, like having one single point of failure, one uh, single entity, let's say, uh, which hosts the whole infrastructure, or it can be decentralized as, as we are, where uh, multiple node providers are uh, empowering, let's say, uh, the protocol. So that, that might, uh, I think that's a fair explanation. So that's incredible. I think you have a whole world where I can just either have all of my intensive resources on developer operations, or I can go to an AT API provider, but then you guys are actually decentralizing the API provisionary approach, which I haven't really seen be done, not by too many people who want to take on that challenge, because I think what you're burdened with is making sure that that API is ridiculously fast. So I'm, I'll, I'll dive in deeper later about how exactly you have built this when we get into more technical discussions, but I'm sure that you guys have built it to be really robust. I'm assuming it was built in C++ so that you can achieve these speeds. Uh, am I right in assuming that? Well, it was actually uh, some components were written in C++ just because because of that for the, for being fast. But uh, then we also upgraded to Rust uh, because Rust is also fast and it's a more uh, nice language, let's say. So uh, it, your your intuition was was on spot. Well, that's good to know. It's good for the Rust maxis that are out there. Um, I, I wonder how the Golang maxis are feeling at this point hearing us, but uh, but never mind that. Um, I, I love where this is going because now that I have a full picture of how this is all going to kind of work together, and I see how you can actually provide this service to even storage or Greenfield, and I really eventually want to get into Greenfield, but we're not going to have enough time to explain what Greenfield is. But for anyone who doesn't know who's on this call, is you know Greenfield is also a decentralized storage network. And um, it's made up of many different storage providers that have their own service level agreement. And that service level agreement is offering different specs like what storage is offering, which is cheap, secure, and readily available data in a, a very cost effective, uh, sorry, cost effective environment. So I want to start to understand how you guys start to look at the industry where we have to start transitioning into a more user-owned economy because that's the whole point of why we're doing this. And I would say that's the whole purpose of Web3. And what is it to trustlessly own your own data? Um, because I don't really hear too many people argue in favor of web three for this one particular reason. So I want to get really, really strong arguments from your guys' perspective, because we're bringing in philosophy into the conversation. But from your perspective, what does it mean to trustlessly own your own data? Yeah, sure thing. So I think owning your data in the sense that web three refers to it generally means the process of using public key cryptography as an access control mechanism for some process. Uh, so we can think of Bitcoin in the kind of common trope, not your keys, not your coin. And I think that kind of embodies uh, what it means for data ownership in Web3. On EVM-based systems like Ethereum uh, and others, uh, the, the private key is used to control access to executable code that's called smart contracts. Uh, and so I think the data ownership extends from Bitcoin to simply 
controlling value transfer to then controlling computer processes. And that's where we start to hear uh, the reference to data ownership. With decentralized cloud, it's a lot of the same thing. On storage, we like to say, not your keys, not your data. So if Bitcoin's not your keys, not your coin, Ethereum is not your keys, not your computational gas, uh, storage is not your keys, not your data. On decentralized cloud, uh, all of your access gets boiled down to uh, an encryption key that uh, only you as uh, the user should have access to. Uh, and that's what kind of, again, uh, underpins some of the security mechanisms of storage. And so we can always uh, decrypt data. Uh, we can always make it publicly accessible. But as a first principle, everything should be encrypted. And that, uh, that first principle has been applied now across the internet. That's so why we have HTTPS. We have that little secure lock symbol. And that basically represents secure encrypted data in transit. And we're, we're seeing more and more encryption being used as a primitive to power the data ownership economy. When we start to couple together decentralized cloud with Ethereum, with BNB, with smart contracts, uh, what we get is an access control mechanism that tightly couples uh, the access on chain to data execution, uh, pointing that towards off chain data stores. Uh, and that's when we start to get this data ownership economy um, that, that we're also excited about. Thank you for making that connection because um, I, I, first of all, thank you for unloading that amount of knowledge and briefly putting it into the framework of execution and storage execution and how we're going to be able to start using permissions to execute smart contractual uh, data fragments in a decentralized cloud system. And now that we're able to actually do this through Greenfield's APIs, storage is going to be able to leverage this API and make it accessible for BNB developers to actually start executing data in the cloud. And so I was looking into the storage networks uh, documentation and I read a little bit about this snapshot feature and I, I was just curious on what is a blockchain snapshot just for everybody else who, who isn't aware like me. What is that and how does it solve for the storage and the distribution of data problem in today's environment? Yeah, sure thing. I'll, I'll kind of start it at the, the foundation. So the first thing to, to understand would be the, the state of the blockchain is a bunch of strung together, right, blocks of data that, uh, you know, the, the entire blockchain itself usually composes in an archival node, a geth node or an Aragon node. Uh, to be over a terabyte of data. Uh, so that's referred to as the chain state. Uh, in the blockchain paradigm, that data, that chain state, is the thing that everybody's trying to keep alive through decentralization. Uh, it's kind of, you know, it's the, the ledger. And so it's all of the ledger data. And so one of the key principles of decentralization as it relates to blockchains is that all you need is one node that has that entire state history and the entire blockchain network can be recreated from one node. So uh, some people relate it to like a virus where, you know, basically this thing self replicates. And uh, if we think of the blockchain in, in that sense, the state history then is that kind of genetic material of the blockchain. And so it's empirical, uh, it's imperative um, that we uh, that we keep that data secure that we keep it accessible and that we always have some backup or reference to it. And so when we think of blockchain snapshots, uh, what that means is basically taking uh, that entire chain state history, uh, the, all the blocks together, and uh, in storing them in a way that's, that's really accessible via object storage. It's basically, it's a backup of the blockchain. Uh, storage as a network is very well suited for storing blockchain snapshots because of the way that data is spread across a global network of over 20,000 nodes and made highly available globally without uh, you know, kind of the classic data center points of failure. And so that's another key reason that decentralized storage is well suited for, for snapshots. Uh, when we try to run a node, if anyone tries to be a validator on a blockchain network, you need a copy of the, of the state history to run the blockchain. If we try to sync that state history from the network using the native distributed hash table or Kademlia based method, we often find that it's extremely slow. On Ethereum and on other networks, it can take uh, weeks to even download all of that data. Uh, if we use the kind of the native parallelism and, and decentralized cloud, we can uh, reduce that runtime of gathering all of that data um, instead of kind of in a really slow Kademlia based way, we can do it through kind of a highly parallel 
uh, data transfer mechanism. Uh, and we can reduce the time that it takes to spin up a node from weeks to hours. And that's uh, what we're looking to do with storage. And that's what we've basically proven out with some of our snapshot uh, kind of distribution uh, based mechanisms. And I even have a copy of the BNB snapshot on my computer. And if it's interesting, I can show what it looks like when you download that file from the decentralized cloud. And I can visualize all of the network connections as well. Where I'm still wondering is on, uh, on the other end is making sure that that endpoint isn't gonna fail. And that way I can actually access this from any point in the world. Does this ever, um, it, has this ever been like a cause or a concern or a question, or has it ever been raised uh, from your point of view that maybe uh, random areas in the world can't access, you know, this information or has that, um, has that never come up? Actually, in, 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 in your opinion, is it hard to access storage or is it fairly easy uh, on a global perspective? Is there any kind of information on this? Yeah, so storage the network is really easy to access uh, because we're distributed across over 22,000 points of presence today. Uh, and I think we're in 170 different countries and territories. And so we have really massive distribution in terms of presence. And that's basically been been able to be possible, you know, not by building data centers, laying concrete, putting in air conditioning, HVAC systems, uh, and, and causing all of kind of the, the embodied environmental emissions that are associated with that. Rather than doing that, what we've done is we've taken an approach similar to Uber, Airbnb, where we've gone to data centers who you know generally only use about 40 percent of their capacity and we say hey you have all this extra capacity this elastic supply if you run this docker container you can monetize all that supply and you can get paid for extra storage and bandwidth and so by that kind of uh value proposition uh we've been able to build a network uh that has so many points of presence uh without even building a single data center and so we think that that's very important from like an environmental uh, green ESG perspective. Um, and also you can think of it uh, in the perspective of depreciating hardware, it extends the useful life of hardware um, for data centers and helps them monetize capacity, which otherwise wouldn't be monetized. And so that's why we've been able to build such an available network. Thank you for diving in a little bit deeper on like how this is actually affecting the world. And, and, and so I want to move on to the next uh, major point, which is a little bit more on the technical end on on how these sorts of systems are actually being used, because I see now that like storage being available to Greenfield is going to be this very amazing thing. And we get a lot of this access that you guys have already done. I mean, 22,000 nodes is absolutely insane. So but on, on, on another end is, you know, how does this impact uh, the level of privacy and security. And, and I actually, I'm very curious from Flavian, your perspective on this, where once this data is becoming made readily available to people, how do you guys perceive data being made available if it's not being made publicly available versus being privately available? And is there a way to secure this? I guess my question is, how does decentralization impact data privacy and security in your perspective so let's say you are using uh, you are using facebook uh, you're not paying for for that service right so you're using it for free and uh, it's a well known fact that when you're using a product and you're not paying for it you're actually the product and in that case, uh, services like uh, uh, like Facebook or and other uh, you know centralized uh, uh, data owners, let's say, uh, who are hosting your data, are actually using your data to sell it uh, to other uh, you know other services uh, to monetize on your behavior. So uh, the fact of uh, the purpose of decentralization decentralizing data it's more around uh, ownership let's say and uh, with ownership uh, you can simply say who uh, can uh, access it and uh, uh, if it's if you want you can also make it 
public or, or private. As a matter of fact, uh, while looking into, uh, into BNB Greenfield, uh, we simply saw a lot of use cases in, in that direction. Uh, so for example, uh, you can enable privacy uh, with, with your key. Uh, and also be able to monetize your, your data in, uh, in that direction uh, by having a mixture of uh, storage provider networks and also tied up with, uh, uh, with a blockchain side like the, the BNB where uh, it's, it can simply be uh, used in that direction for monetizing, let's say, uh, your data. So uh, from a technical point of view, uh, you can achieve that by having a, uh, an honest layer of storing data. So uh, you, you just have to think about uh, like the backbone of all those, these products uh, like Facebook and, and so on. If they are built on top of an honest way of storing your data, let's say you're doing it through uh, uh, one idea that comes to mind is doing through, uh, through blockchain, right? And using cryptography uh, for, uh, for doing so. And uh, if you own the core level of, uh, of the infrastructure, so actually owning your data, you can decide who can use your data and in what way they can do that. Even though the product, let's say Facebook, is built on top of uh, on top of that, it simply enforces you uh, not enforces it empowers you to um, to make decisions uh, based on your your data. And if you don't want it, it simply uh, you, you can simply say no. So that's uh, that's that's my my view. Um, but what's the intent? of actually doing it in this way. Because when I try to tell somebody, use Google OneDrive, they automatically understand what that means. So how do you tell somebody who's not familiar with storage or Greenfield to start using your software? Yeah, it's a great question. I think where we've seen uh, a lot of adoption uh, in terms of kind of outside of the Web3 snapshot space is video streaming. And so all applications stream video and as video moves from 1080p to 4K to 8K to even now 16K, the, the file size of that underlying object data is growing exponentially. And so there are great charts online where you can see how much bigger 4K is than 1080p and how much bigger 16K is than 4K. The nice thing about decentralized storage is that because of its parallelism, it gets faster the larger the file is because there's more pieces that are streamed in parallel. And uh, that makes video a really strong use case for decentralized cloud. Hmm. Generally, applications where there's a very low need for CDN. So CDNs are services like Cloudflare, Fastly, CloudFront on Amazon, Akamai, uh, and others. Uh, where there's kind of a low usage of CDN, the, uh, the decentralized object store can replace both the CDN and the underlying S3 layer inside of an application stack, reducing costs simplifying the experience for developers and uh, generally creating a better experience for the consumers that are using that app uh, due to the the globally available nature of the decentralized cloud. Wow. And so I do think we'll start to see um, applications that, that use video, um, which is why I'm focused on generative AI video output mm. uh, and transcoding partners. Um, we'll start to see more and more uh, groups that store their video and stream it for their applications on the decentralized cloud. That's epic. I just wanted to add from, uh, you know, from, from the previous uh, question, like how we can get to mass adoption. Because here, uh, I think that the most important factor is how can decentralized uh, infrastructure in general, decentralized products can be at the same level as, uh, you know, centralized uh, products. Th that's the main issue because uh, you have to have a reason to make the change. If you are happy with uh, S3 or other products, there's no reason to change. But if you have an equal uh, use, uh, product with similar user experience, 
that, and you have another reason on top of that, then that's the, the way uh, to do it. So the first step would be, how can we make this as simple as possible for someone that doesn't have, you know, uh, technical background or blockchain knowledge or, or things like that? It should be stupidly simple. And then on top of that, they should have a reason for going for decentralized storage, like a, a, a narrative, like uh, why is the is it beneficial for for them to use uh, uh, Greenfield or 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 storage and uh, not S3? So I think that's uh, that's the main uh, main thing that uh, could lead to uh, mass adoption. Uh, those two factors user experience and re a reason uh on top of that and we can clearly see what the reasons are like uh, ownership of your data monetization and uh and things like that mm. i think we're gonna lean really heavily on this ownership factor i think what you're saying is really more the narrative approach though and that's gonna deliver a lot of these reasons but in order for us to deliver the reasons of why ownership and these other sorts of factors like cost and efficiency and the utility and the intent that we were talking about before, it's really how do we make that narrative simple? I think it's a three, two, one, not a one, two, three sort of factor. But I totally agree with you. And it's it, it, it kind of centers into the reasons why we are doing what it is that we're doing. And once people actually start seeing the benefits of using this then at that point, I think we're going to start seeing a huge influx of usage. And, uh, you know, I, I would say how we then have to start ensuring others that, hey, a decentralized system is truly decentralized. And no, no, it's not becoming centralized over time. How do we maintain this level of uh, efficiency because it might get so efficient to the point where we start reducing uh, the size of the decentralized uh, network of nodes do you do you guys see this ever potentially happening because I know that there is the uh, what's that curve called where you know as hardware accelerates and as speed and, and everything else accelerates uh, so too does everything else Maybe Moore's computer site. Yeah. Moore's law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Moore's law. Exactly. <laughs> Do you see Moore's law kind of actually like getting in the way of decentralization? Is that probably a part of it? Um, I, I can tell you one, one thing. So by looking at the infrastructure level, uh, if you're running a node, let's say a blockchain node, it kind of grows exponentially. So, uh, uh, after one year, instead of uh, one terabyte, you'd have two terabytes on uh, on a particular use chain because it gets more adoption, more transactions happens, and it kind of grows and grows and grows. And that's not sustainable. So uh, we should think of ways in which uh, we split the... The, the core infrastructure in uh, in you know archive data that's not uh, needed anymore or in a re read only fashion that can be stored on a, a very uh, let's say cheap kind of storage uh, platform uh, so that would be one way of doing it and uh, cleaning up that uh, those nodes for uh, stale, stale data, let's say, or uh, archive data that's not really uh, relevant anymore now. And having an API on top of it just to get queries from, uh, uh, from past data from a storage, like so. I think that's my take on, uh, on that. So this is a really good question. If we look back at the notes, I have a, a interesting question for you guys, because when we start thinking about the consolidation of nodes and there's a lot of literally useless data that doesn't need to be there anymore. And after talking to you, Kevin, about snapshots and how you're kind of taking whole chunks of blockchain data and kind of sizing it up, 
it's um, becoming clear to me that perhaps the middle layer, I don't know if I should say middleware, but the middle layer of L1 and L2 is this decentralized storage network where I should be able to start storing L2 data that is then being stored on L1 and vice versa. So is this like the long end game uh, version of how we're going to start consolidating like the massive amounts of data that's happening on L2? Because as we see it, the state of L2 is only going to just get more and more busy because it's already extremely fast and efficient, but they have the same problem L1 has, storing all that data. So is a DSN really the thing that's going to kind of sit in the middle so that both L1 and L2 have a mutual relationship to growing like the Web3 in general? Is this the idea? You know, I think it's a little bit, I think that's notionally correct. So I think decentralized storage is a really great use case to store snapshots of the data uh, that's stored in L1 and L2 systems. And I think the analogy is probably more similar to an object store versus a database, right? So a database is something that has really high transactional throughput that you read, that you basically write to frequently that's like, quote unquote, live. And the storage network would be more static snapshots, periodic backups of that data that's stored. And so what that does, it makes it easier to spin up nodes, with thus making these underlying protocols more decentralized. But I think the key promise ultimately of, of L2 is to actually root itself inside of L1, thus sharing in its security. And so the analogy that I always like to think of, uh, the visual analogy, is if you, if you think of the blockchain as a tree, block, 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 what L2 look, starts to look like is a branch that's rooted in that main tree. And so zero knowledge rollups are a great example where there are what are called circuits, uh, which are logic circuits where you take strings of zero knowledge proofs that are rooted on chain that are looped out of the chain, loop back into it, that create liveliness that use the data availability principle of the L1 to root their own security in the security of the of that of the L, of the L1 of the base layer. And so, uh, you know, I always think the tree analogy of the the main chain and then kind of the L2s as branches uh, that then are rooted in the main chain. Is, is a good visual analogy for people that are trying to understand what that architecture looks like. I love it, but what if a bird lands on that tree and the whole network gets purged? What happens to all those funds? What what like what's our suggestion for L2s putting their, you know, whatever however much data and assets on an Ethereum network? What's what is the solution there? Is it like full exit security? Is it like the data has to get stored in a decentralized server like storage or these green fields to like make sure that that blockchain can persist over time. What's your, what would be your like long end view of that? Yeah, yeah, that's, you're right. It's, it's actually both of those two things. And so the, the key goal of the construction of L2s is that if there is some break in the sequencer that you're able to basically like flood all of that data back on chain recover it so that no funds are lost. So that's kind of what I think generally one of the key security principles of L2s. Um, and then the other one is to, to basically have a data availability layer. And this plays into what's called the modular blockchain architecture thesis, where you separate data availability from state from the execution layer. And if you separate out that data availability layer to a decentralized storage network, then if the chain halts, uh, and you have a snapshot of it, you can always re send that snapshot back to a new GPU or sequencer to kind of bring it back to life so that you don't miss a beat. Um, and so that can add uh, security to the L2 uh, in terms of its liveliness. Um, but the goal ultimately is that you uh, get rid of the risk of losing funds by rooting the security in the main network, um, to my understanding of L2s. Wow, so that's... Um obviously down the actual rabbit hole of of this whole thing but i'd like to try to summarize this because zk bnb if you guys have looked into that as well i know greenfield is exciting but zk bnb comes with this full exit functionality where you not only get to withdraw funds but you actually get to completely full exit all funds if you need to in case of networks actually get purged and this is the security of the bnb network which is pretty cool so all L2s, if in the future, if we have more L2s join the network, which is not the case right now, but we have ZKBNB, at least for the time being, this is actually an, a feature. And then 
ZK BNB comes equipped with its own sets of APIs, which uh, Flavian, I'm not sure if you've looked at that, but there's like an entire page of just a ton of APIs. So it'd be cool to see how we can use like Beware or Blast API with, with ZK BNB. But anyway, that's going away from my point. My point is, is that I understand how if data is no longer made available, it could be on a decentralized storage network. We can grab a snapshot, send it back to a GPU to recover that data in the way that it was uh, encoded to begin with, which is, I believe, is erasure encoding, but we're using Reed Solomon on Greenfield. So this is the way that we're actually recovering that data. And then we're sending it back to a node that then generates that feed so that the user can put it somewhere else. And on Greenfield, once I recover the data, I'm actually allowed to put it on another storage provider. So I have this ability to select and choose uh, where I'm actually going to store that data. So I think the problem with data ownership is also we're not always thinking about the control. I might own my keys, but if... I don't know, Coinbase shuts down. How am I going to get access to my keys? Like, I mean, I have the private key, but I have to build an entire interface so I can get back control to start using my wallet. And I think we don't distinguish the difference enough between control and ownership since that's what a title is. And is this something that you guys uh, in your... Uh, think tank meetings ever is like, how do we allow for people to control their data and not just own their data? Is this ever a topic of conversation with you and your teams? Open-ended question. Yeah, so I can take it first. So it's definitely a key question. Uh, what we've basically kind of leaned into at storage is this concept called macaroons, uh, which was originally formulated by Google as a decentralized way to do access control. And there's a great paper on it, on macaroons from 2014 from the Google research team. We've implemented it live at storage. Uh, what macaroons are is that they're hashed message authentication codes. Basically, uh, they're, they're APIs that run through hashing algorithms that can then further restrict how you access control to data. And so say you have an API key that gives you read access to some uh, bucket of data. If you then hash that access, and then you get, you know, uh, instead of read write access, read only access, for example, or if you hash it in a certain way, you can time bound access to that data. And so we've implemented macaroons as an alternative to access control lists to basically power uh, the the way that authorization towards data sets work on the decentralized cloud. So it's something we're definitely thinking about as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah, Flavian, is there? A, did you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, on our side, uh, um, there's no, uh, we don't have any issues around ownership, let's say. Uh, for us, it's more about integrity, like how can we trust someone from, from the network that's not a bad actor, let's say, in our decentralized infrastructure. So how, how can we uh, uh, m make sure that uh, if someone comes to, uh, to our network, he doesn't have malicious, uh, malicious intentions? So in that regard, we've built an integrity protocol, which actually uh, uh, looks into the data that's uh, that's being fetched and uh, compares with uh, with other nodes uh, from the network randomly selected and if we see uh, someone that is misbehaving he gets uh, immediately uh, out of the network uh, let's say and he also has a um, monetization part as he loses his stake uh, that he added when he entered the network so that's uh, that's our take. Uh, so, you know, I'm very much focused on how large data sets, like those that are used to train machine learning models, uh, are, are continue to be democratized. And so if we look at, you know, for example, Stable Diffusion, a really popular text to image generation tool that powers a lot of the top stores in the App Store, and I believe powers other services like MidJourney, the data set that was used to train that was 250 terabytes and it was 5.8 billion pictures. And so it's really critical that 
you know, from a research perspective, but also from just an open access perspective, that these data sets are able to be notarized on chain so we can first have, you know, this stamp of authenticity that this data set hasn't changed since this point in time, right? That's critical for AI research, but also that these data sets are actually available and that there are snapshots and backups of them and that anybody can access them to train their own models. And the same goes for the trained models themselves. The models that are used to train, that are used to create inferences, outputs for AI, whether that's text to video, text to picture, even LLM outputs should all be stored on the decentralized cloud and made available on the decentralized cloud. Um, and you know that's one kind of architecture and, and principle that I'm really excited uh, to support. That's sick. And Flavian, yeah, what's um, what's on your mind when you guys initially looked at Greenfield and obviously you and your team kind of discussed about it? What were some of the things that were coming to your mind about what you were going to see uh, come out of it? Uh, one big use case that we uh, we saw was around digital publishing. So uh, that really, uh, uh, you know, came to, to our mind that uh, it would really have a, a, an impact on on society, let's say. So instead of uh, doing like a, publishing your book on uh, on Amazon or, or something uh, like that or with a publisher, you can simply publish it in, in your own storage uh, on, on Greenfield and then come up with a DAP uh, on top of it and monetize it on on another on another chain so on for example on bnb uh to be able to to sell it and make distribution of it so you you can make a whole economy uh within your community uh around uh, digital goods let's say so you, you can either sell uh music or uh, or other type of digital uh, assets let's say so that's that's something that uh, we truly think that uh, it, it have it will have an impact uh, uh, in in society as a whole. I, I totally agree. Um, digital publication on Greenfield is going to be available. It's available right now on storage, but I'm I'm especially interested with these permission sets so that people actually have like we were talking about before, which is this level of control where I can get the data, move the data, delete the data, uh, you know, regain ownership of the data, vote on the data. I can do all sorts of things using a smart contract, but I can do this with a DAO and then the DAO owns that data and can perhaps make their own website together. And then they can start actually activating social good or public good means in and around the world, have the whole site be published on a domain that's processed and made available through Greenfield and they can sell things like books or music or art art in general. And I think new sorts of art markets can finally start opening up. And I think one last thing I was personally more excited about was individualistic NFT marketplaces rather than, you know, an open sea or a tofu. It's that everyone has the ability to make their own marketplace so that they can just walk around town and go check out my uh my MySpace looking NFT marketplace, which is what I originally thought it was going to be cool for, or like a decentralized podcast since it requires an RSA feed. So we were trying to get the bread and butter podcast on Greenfield. That was the, that's the big idea here. So I love the AI thing. And I think with ChatGPT is like one really clear example of how we're going to take something that's seemingly really, really large, but then do something that's incredible with it and people can actually start doing research consortiums or building a research consortium around some sort of artificially intelligent uh, set of information, perhaps. And then they can like collect this data and then move on to some generalized and very organized next set of instructions. I mean, do you see large sets of data and AI research, Kevin, in like a way where it's going to improve what exactly? I'm just kind of curious on what what this is you think is going to be mainly used for, especially with blockchain, since it's mainly like a financial instrument. Yeah. So the key thing to build any kind of uh, 
AI, generative AI model is there, there are two kind of key ingredients. Uh, the first ingredient is access to GPUs, the computers that train the networks. The other key ingredient is the access to the underlying data sets. So data is oil when it comes to the machine learning information generative AI economy. And so access to large data sets like Common Crawl, which is a snapshot of the internet and other kind of prune data sets are critical to creating AI applications like ChatGPT. And so the more rich the data, the more rich the machine learning model is. Good data in, good output out. And uh, that's where I think the, the importance lies. Uh, so I, I truly believe the user experience is uh, is is the one that needs uh, most uh, the, uh, most Im improvement in that regard. Uh, just think about uh, how often does it happen to have issues uh, while using a web to product, and how often uh, has that hap uh, happened when using a like a decentralized one. So uh, I think that's uh, that's the uh, most important factor uh, to improve. If uh, we want to be competitive and gather a lot of adoption, to make sure that what we build is uh, taught at scale and uh, without uh, breaking uh, in pieces from time to time. I think reliability and user experience are the most important factors because in in in, in this in industry when we first got it was fine for things to break it was fine for uh you know for <clears throat> uh for an uh, ico to or or website to be down when on high load but that's not fine in traditional web 2 so that's the kind of mentality we have to embrace in order uh, to uh, to succeed we we have to come to go with a mentality where everything should work seamlessly and especially from a technical perspective mm. I couldn't agree more we've had a whole discussion on this with uh, notify and push uh, protocol yesterday about how this is actually the number one problem and that's what they're aiming to solve is also a part of that is the communications that are involved with how blockchains are doing something in the cloud but then I'm not going to get any notification on it um, and I need to have this communication between me and decentralized storage providers since it's all open source and it's a complete mess like if we think about it it's so many pieces working together it's a massive community of people coming together to build this one application so there needs to be communication and the user experience needs to be flawless. But besides that, um, let's dig a little bit deeper on maybe what are the technical things that are holding us back from achieving the perfect end user experience? What is it in your opinion, Kevin, is uh, holding us back the most from your guys's research? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, there in terms of what's holding back decentralization, decentralized cloud storage. I don't think that there's a lot technically. I think we can, you know, now empirically show the performance, the economic and the security benefits of decentralized cloud. Uh, the hurdle now is actually more about, it's a marketing problem. It's how do we actually get people to convert from centralized storage protocols that they might be more comfortable with to take that jump towards decentralized storage so they can reap the benefits in terms of being, you know, having 90% cost savings having better global availability and performance, having native encryption by default. It's really, it's it's getting people onto this new boat. And, you know, I see that as the biggest challenge and it's one that we all as an industry are excited to tackle. Yeah, marketing is 50% of the challenge. Engineering is the other 50% of the challenge. And even though as unfair as that may sound, it's it's so crazy true in so many different ways. But I think if you build something that's really solid and performant, you also need to have a really good team that understands the true tried nature and the purpose, which, I mean, you guys obviously are coming to the table today with a really large bank of knowledge on what it is that it needs to be. But yeah, Flavian, is there uh, something you wanted to add? Yeah, I truly agree here uh, with, with the marketing issue. And th th that's a problem in general. So building a great product 
is uh, some say that it's 50 percent of, uh, of of the job but sometimes it goes even lower and uh, distribution like marketing and sales it's uh, way more important so uh, focusing on how we can uh, reach out to, uh, to potential users and customers and in general play plays a major factor i mean you, you can't compete uh with uh how many funds uh a big company has uh with a smaller scale uh product even though uh even though it, it's a superior product from from multiple points of view so we sh should have the funds in which to go at a global scale distribution as well so i i could i couldn't agree more on on that well this um was enlightening and i think you guys are really kind of touching on the main uh the the main pain point that we're all trying to kind of learn and understand and I think a lot of the business developers that are listening in to this little section of the podcast are going to start to think to themselves like what is the level of uh, uh, I would say intent and care that needs to get put into the people's hands and then how am I going to deliver that message while also making sure that it's not I would say we should do less selling we should do more enablement you know, we never want to sell anything. We always want to say to somebody, this is why your life is actually going to improve. This is how you are going to relish now that we're solving your problems. If we can solve people's problems, then we're doing our job. And at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. And uh, so anyway, uh, I'll get off my high horse. Yeah. What's up, Flavian? Is <laughs> Yeah, and, and for that, it's not only distribution, because, for example, you arrive to some people, yes, and they are using your product, but in the end, they should be really happy with using it. And uh, from there, they would tell their friends and they will use it as well. And that's a really important factor as well. So first, you have to arrive at people and then to be very happy uh, with, with what they're using, to be able to spread it in a normal conversation that they would have at the office or, or randomly. And I, I think that's the key. Maybe we're overcomplicating it, right? Maybe it's like, I'm trying to explain all these different avenues, but maybe it's as simple as, it just works, bro. And then just kind of leave it at that. And then they kind of see the difference and you go, yeah, you like this? Do you like the other thing? No? Okay, you should move on to this. Like less brain power, more clicky clicky on the buttons. And I think then people would start to see it. And then I'm happy because it's doing something that's really cool. Look at ChatGPT. I, I, it takes no more than 10 seconds. Somebody sends me the link. I click try. It gives me a response. My mind is blown. I tell my 10 friends, I, what, like that's automatic at that point. You know, the product speaks for itself in a lot of ways, but it's about getting it into the right hands. And that's exactly what they did. They gave it to a lot of tech nerds and devs. And they're like, yo, if you use ChatGPT, it's going to code for you. So what do you think every developer and their friends did as soon as they got it? They gave it to all of their developer friends. And then this thing blew up. It was like three days after I heard about it that people freaked out about it. And then before that conversation, no one cared about AI. We always talked about it, but what was the thing that mattered? Well, to developer, it was saving time on coding. And then as soon as they saw that, their minds were blown and they shared it with everybody. That's at least how I saw that transgressing. And it was incredible to see that revolution happening right in front of our eyes. And I mean, Kevin, you're, you're literally an AI. I mean, I don't think that ever happened until GPT really came around. Cause I mean, wasn't it pretty, wasn't it already around for like a year or two? Like, yeah, it's a great question. So GPT two had been around for a while and as a company, we were really kind of interested in how GPT two, which was released in 2019, in February was going to disrupt uh, large language models broadly. Uh, 
GPT-3, I think, came out a year later. So it's been around for a while. It wasn't until chat GPT that we really started to see people like experimenting with the technology. And that was due to the inclusion of what's called RLHF, reinforcement learning based on human feedback, uh, which creates that kind of question and answer bot-like structure that we see for chat GPT. Uh, in RLHF, you know, data sets are really interesting. Uh, at Storage, we're participating in an open source ecosystem play called Open Assistant, which is building a open source uh, RLHF data set to help create an open source alternative to chat GPT. That's sick. So is that like one of the use cases that you see Web3 D apps uh, in storage or even on Greenfield? are going to provide to BNB developers? Is this like open assistant? Is is that like one of your main objectives for like decentralized applications is using this assistant application? Well, storage can always distribute the data sets and the models mm. that power those assistants. Ah, I see. And uh, I can see how like an artificially intelligent assistant can help me maybe even make messages and provide me a message of what's happening to my contracts or to my liquidity on chain. Is that sort of the idea of open assistant? I think that's right. You know, I think an untapped space around large language models uh, are the, is the way that it interfaces with areas like block explorers. I think in the future, the way that humans interact with computers uh, is going to shift from kind of the standard user experience of screens to something that's a little bit more language native, possibly. And if that occurs, we want to be able to sign transactions, query the blockchain, and access the underlying data store that is the blockchain by using these LLM methods. And so I think that that's kind of a really interesting area um, that will be exciting to see how different startups, companies uh, approach. Wow. All right. So I, I, I'm lost for words. I am my mind is kind of blown right now. I mean, it's, it, it feels like we're so early. Um, there was so much put onto the table and I'm going to have to collect all my notes and see what we're going to, what we're going to write about this. But there are so many really awesome ideas. You guys were absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time and really explaining all the different facets of information. I feel like we went down several rabbit holes today, but that's really fun. And I see how we can start connecting dots at a later time. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Um, I'll end it on this note. So uh, thank you everybody for listening. I hope that you uh, go and follow these guys. Kevin, uh, Flavian, where can everybody find you? What's the best way of getting to uh, contact with you? Yeah, you can always follow me on Twitter. My handle is K-L-E-F-F-E-W-9-4. And you can always reach out to me directly on Telegram, which is BitKevin, B-I-T Kevin. I'm always happy to talk to anyone, developers, business people about decentralized cloud storage and help them integrate decentralized cloud storage into their own business architecture, application workflows, uh, and into their own use cases. Awesome. Flavian, where can we find you? You can find me on on Twitter uh, with Fla Flavian uh, underline Beware. Uh, also on Telegram, uh, LinkedIn. So I'm all over the place. Uh, you can also learn more about Beware Labs and Blast API. Just make a Google search and we are the first that would uh, pop up there. And from there you have a very broad uh, uh, piece of information where you can learn about anything we do. Awesome. Well, I hope your guys' docs ends up on the decentralized cloud one day and then we'll all live in a decentralized happy land or something. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, guys. Um, and cheers, everybody. I hope you have a good rest of your day and uh, take care.